All right. Welcome everyone to another installment of Gardens and Grub, All Things Food. I'm your buddy Sherilyn Berry here at the lovely Extension office in downtown Durham. Um, we're going to talk for about 20 minutes about a very um, interesting topic uh, that was requested from some of our watchers. Uh, we're going to talk for about 20 minutes and then we're going to open it up for questions for the last 10 minutes. So feel free to raise your hand or um, write in the chat box a question on Zoom or direct message us on Facebook. So uh, today we are going to talk about fertilizer. So um, although this isn't a food ingredient, it's required uh, to have food. We need fertilizer. Um, so we want to talk about what this is so that you understand um, why plants need these things. Um, but also we're going to challenge sort of your view of what fertilizers are. Um, so on all fertilizer packages, there's going to be three numbers. Don't pay attention to the brand names on any of these, or this is just to demonstrate th what these numbers mean. Okay. So, um, one brand isn't better than another necessarily because they're all going to give you numbers, nutrients. Okay. There's always going to be one, two, three numbers on here. Here's another example of that. One, two, three numbers on here. And those numbers always in order are the content of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. You will find these three as elements on the periodic table, and they are plant major nutrients. These are necessary, not only for us as humans, but for plants as well. And so you're always going to see by law, they have to put N, P, and K on the packaging. Maybe it's not on the front of the package, like as in the case of this one. This doesn't have it on the on the front of the package, but it's always going to have it somewhere on the package. So there you go. Ooh, three fancy numbers right there. One, two, three. Okay. So they're always in the order N, P, K. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. The reason that potassium has a K is because it's the Latin name for potassium. I can't remember it, but it starts with a K. So N, P, K. Let's talk a little bit about what each one of these does for plants. So um, the first one, nitrogen. Nitrogen is a really important nutrient. It is a component of chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is what makes plants green. Um, without it, a plant cannot photosynthesize. Um, chlorophyll is the active ingredient in plants that allow, it's sort of like the hemoglobin in our blood. Um, a hemoglobin in our blood allows us to trap oxygen in our lungs and carry it to the tissues of our body. Um, with nitrogen, um, with, with nitrogen, chlorophyll is able to actually trap light, breathe in air, the form of carbon dioxide and create starch using water, light, and air. That's how the plant makes its body. It's amazing. It never ceases to amaze me that a plant is an autotroph. That means it makes its own food. It's the plants are the only ones that do that in, in the lot in life cycle. I think maybe some algae does as well, but anything that can photosynthesize can make its own food and things that make their own food are the food for everything else in the world. We and animals, the animal world, the fungal world are, are heterotrophs, which means they have to go out into the world to bring food into us. Whereas autotrophs make their own food and plants do this, but chlorophyll is necessary for that to happen. So nitrogen is an essential component in it. If you don't have enough nitrogen for your plants, they'll be yellow. Um, they'll, they'll get, um, because there's, they won't, without enough nitrogen, um, the plant can't create chlorophyll. So the plant will actually be yellow. It's called chlorosis. Um, give it a goog or a, you know, a web search. I should have printed out a picture of chlorosis for you. Um, just because a plant is yellow doesn't mean 100% that it's lacking in nitrogen. There could be other reasons for it, um, but that is a major factor um, in, um, you know, in not having enough nitrogen for your plants. You can get a soil test for phosphorus and potassium, but there is not a soil test for nitrogen because nitrogen gets used up by plants very quickly. And so if you test for nitrogen, 
it's, you know, it, it isn't really going to tell you anything except for what was available at that moment, um, because plants need nitrogen all the time. It's like they can burn through it pretty quickly because as the plant grows, it makes more and more and more chlorophyll. Um, so it's, it's essential. It's like the number one nutrient for plants. So often, you know, through sort of traditional agriculture, um, the way that plants were looked at was that, you know, you stick a seed in the ground and then the plant grows and you give it everything it needs. You give it its nutrients, you give it its water. Um, but the old, old way of thinking and now new with the sustainable ag movement and sort of the slower ag movement, uh, there's a movement of thinking of rather than feeding the plant to feed the soil. If you feed the soil, the soil will take care of the plant with more than just nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. It will also take care of it with like microbial growth, support, drought tolerance. So consider that when you're buying fertilizers, they're just more of a support for your plants. They need these things. But if you feed your soil, your plant is going to have everything that it needs. So, um, but nitrogen is sort of like the number one thing. Um, nitro nitrogen is also necessary for amino acid development. So in order to grow proteins in the plant, nitrogen is necessary um, so that the plant can make protein. Um, plants are actually really rich in protein. Proteins exist throughout the world and they, I mean, throughout all forms of life. And proteins are um, building blocks to our bodies and to plant bodies, um, but they're also enzymes. So uh, Proteins are both the chemicals and also the chemists because enzymes are mechanical proteins that do things. Um, they, you know, um, do everything. Uh, they're sort of the, um, the machinists of life. Um, it's hard, you know, every, everything that we digest, everything a plant digests and, and uses and moves and, um, and it, it, photosynthesis, all of those reactions in the body of ourselves and plant and all of life um, are because of enzymes and proteins. Enzymes are just proteins that move around and do stuff. And so if your plant doesn't have enough nitrogen, it's not gonna be able to keep, keep make proteins or enzymes. And then the plant can't do stuff to make its own, its own self, its own body. So nitrogen is very, very important. Um, you wanna make sure that when you are using fertilizer, always read the label, please read the label, please, 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 especially in the case of nitrogen, always read the label because if you put too much nitrogen fertilizer on the ground, what often happens is it will leach out into our waterways. And when that happens, like people just, they, they love their lawn and they want it green. And so they put a ton, ton, ton of, of, uh, of fertilizer on it and they run the risk of burning their plants because anything powerful like this, this 20, 20, 20 is, this is, that means by weight, this is 20% nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. That is very, very strong fertilizer. Um, there's another, the most common chemical fertilizer you're gonna find for lawns is 10, 10, 10. And that means by weight, it's 10% nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. But something like this 20, 20, 20, if I just, if I don't read how much I'm supposed to put on there per area, I could just put this all over. I'll probably burn my lawn so that it will be brown. And then that extra nitrogen is gonna leach off in the rain. It's gonna end up in a stream and algae will grow. And that's dangerous. Also, if you dump it, you drink it eventually. Remember that. We are, uh, we depend on surface water here in North Carolina, which means that we are taking water from streams and lakes and filtering it for our drinking water. And so if you're not careful and you just dump a bunch of nitrogen into drinking water, it can actually be really harmful to children, babies under a year old. It, there's a, a syndrome called blue baby syndrome and it affects um, babies in low income areas that get their water from agricultural sources where, um, where nitrogen has leached into the water and then you make a baby bottle out of it and um, the baby takes in a bunch of nitrogen and can actually get blue lips and skin. So avoid, avoid, avoid dumping this stuff all over the ground because it, it causes all kinds of problems, um, but it can be really beneficial. So we're just in the US and in the US, uh, us, us Americans um, sometimes feel like if a little bit is good, then a lot is a lot better. And that's not true. You need to read the label. And this goes for pesticides as well, whether it's pesticide, herbicide, insecticide. Pesticide is like a generic term for all the sides. Um, uh, make sure to read the label. By law, you have to read the label on how to use it because you know it can be effective or it can be really dangerous depending on how much you know. So keep that in mind when you're dealing with fertilizers.
Next, we're gonna move on to P, phosphorus. Oh, before we move on, this is a chemical fertilizer and we'll talk about that um, in, in just a minute, um, the difference between chemical fertilizers and natural fertilizers. Um, but uh, there's also natural sources of nitrogen that you can get. Um, and that is, uh, you can get it from coffee grounds. You can get it from um, man manure, um, blood meal, which sounds disgusting. Like why would you put blood on the ground? Um, actually, uh, for all you vegans out there, plants are not vegan and they're not vegetarian. I mean, they're vegan if you eat them, of course, but plants are not vegetarians. They basically will eat animal everything because it needs all animals and plants and everything break down all the way back down into organic matter and plants will uptake them again. So um, blood meal is a byproduct of the, um, of the uh, meat industry and it's actually really nutritious for plants. So I prefer to use natural sources of fertilizer because it doesn't take a lot of um, fossil fuel to make them. Let's talk about that really quick since we're talking about nitrogen. The difference between a, and don't pay attention to these brand names. It doesn't, this, the brand name doesn't matter. But this is a natural form of fertilizer that comes from manure, blood meal, bone meal, all kinds of things, byproducts of other industries that go back to the earth when you buy them like this. So they're not necessar unnecessarily creating a lot of greenhouse gases by making this stuff. Because it's just, it's sort of like turning trash into cash. You're taking waste from one industry and turning it into food for another. And that's really sort of like a circular thing that we're trying to do when we try to be green and, and you know, responsible with the environment. This, and don't pay attention to the brand name, there's lots of different kinds, is chemical fertilizer. And the way that they create the nitrogen for this fertilizer is they take nitrogen from the air, which 78% of what we're breathing in is nitrogen. There's more nitrogen in the air than anything else. And they take that and they mix it with natural gas. They use tons and tons and tons and tons of fossil fuels to turn it into ammonia and then urea and then ammonium nitrate. So it uses so much natural gas. It puts off a ton of carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide, so NO2, which is like 300 times more harmful to the environment than carbon dioxide. So that's why I try to avoid using um, any of the chemical fertilizers. If somebody gives them to me, I'll use them like at the garden or something on the outside of the fence where we're not organic on the outside of the fence, but on the inside of the fence we are. We're not certified organic, but we use those kinds of practices. Um, if somebody donates something to me, it already exists. So, and somebody gave it to me, so I'd use it, but I wouldn't buy it personally for me um, or for our garden because um, I just know on the big picture of things, how much fossil fuel has gone into making it. So um, it's really, you know, it, it means a lot to me. So um, I would rather turn and help people turn trash into cash. Again, don't pay attention to the brand name. Um, there are lots of natural fertilizers out there that you can get, or you can make your own. You could just go to, um, you know, your local coffee shop and they'll give you coffee grounds. Um, you can uh, keep a couple backyard chickens and compost their manure. Um, there's a lot of different things that you can do to get natural fertilizers into your landscape. Okay, we're running out of time. So let me move on to phosphorus, which is the P in the equation. So um, P, phosphorus. So what phosphorus is necessary for is production of adenosine triphosphate, which is a molecule that allows us to transfer energy between our cells and plant cells. So sometimes I talk about us because even though we are a part of the family of life, all living beings use ATP adenosine triphosphate. And so phosphorus is necessary for, for these um, molecules that allow uh, pa you know, power basically to move between cells so that the plant can stretch and grow and turn towards the light and do all of the things that it needs to do. So, and it's how we're able to talk and move our arms, adenosine triphosphate. It's also a building block of nucleic acids. So your DNA, RNA, um, a ATP is necessary, adenosine triphosphate is necessary. It's a precursor molecule for your genetics and for plant genetics. So um, this is why phosphorus is necessary. Also for root, shoot, seed, and fruit development. So often when somebody comes to me and they say, oh, 
My tomato plants, they're gorgeous, they're green, but there's no fruit or flowers on any of them. It usually means that they put too much nitrogen on them and not enough phosphorus and potassium. So um, also phosphorus and potassium, the P and K, are like supporting molecules for nitrogen. So if there's not enough of these, the plant can't even use nitrogen if you give it to them. So these are like supporting actors of the nitrogen. They all work in concert together. So um, another thing that um, phosphorus does is allows your plants to experience cold stress and drought stress. And they're more flexible in that way. If you feed your soil rather than just feeding the plant, your plant is actually going to be um, more disease resistant, cold tolerant, heat tolerant. If you enrich the soil with organic matter and you feed the soil, you think about feeding the soil and the soil microbes. Um, phosphorus is very dependent on the pH of the soil and the microbial content of the soil. So you can give it phosphorus, you can give the soil phosphorus, but if there isn't a good microbial, um, you know, oomph, a good microbial community in the soil, it's not going to be able to process the phosphorus and feed it to the plant. So again, we want to feed the soil and then the soil will feed the plants. So something to keep in mind. Um, some uh, natural um, forms of uh, phosphorus are, get this, hair, <laughs> shellfish, urine, um, rock phosphate, which is mined, um, you can get this and rock phosphate breaks down really, really slowly. So this is something actually that uh, phosphorus and potassium, uh, make sure to have before you just start willy nilly throwing this around, get your soil tested because they test for phosphorus and potassium. And in the case of my soil test, bless my husband, we heat our house with wood and the man has been dumping the wood ash in the compost pile for years and I did not know this and I was putting it all over my garden and the phosphorus and potassium in my garden are off the charts so I don't need to add it probably for years. It also messed with our pH. Don't just willy-nilly dump wood ash on things because it's alkalizing. Um, we have acidic soils that are about 5.5. 6.5 to 7 is where you want to be if you're growing vegetables. I am at 7.5 because my husband thought he was doing a good thing. So I told him no more wood ash in the compost pile, please sprinkle it on the lawn. Um, anyway, so rock phosphate is a great one. Oh, by the way, urine is a great source of N, P, and K because your body is getting rid of the excess nitrogen from your um, protein uh, processing in your body, phosphorus and potassium all come out in your urine. So there's a lot of people who actually will, I don't recommend it, but it's totally up to you, uh, pee in a bottle and then dump it on their compost pile. Or some people just go out and pee on their compost pile or in their garden. There's nothing wrong with that. However you want to do it. Um, I'm not that intense about it. I would not keep a bottle of urine in my bathroom, but people do it. They do it all the time. Very, very green, very committed people. Okay, so um, let's move on to uh, potassium real quick before we open it up for questions. Um, potassium um, is necessary for water regulation, um, also uh, for the plant to breathe. So without potassium, plant can't, the plant can't open its stomata, which are like little openings, thousands and thousands and thousands of them on the underside of their leaves. And what that does is it allows the plant to breathe. So in very hot environments or hot times during the year, the plant will leave its stomata closed in the middle of the day and they will open them first thing in the morning and then in the evening. And it lets the plant breathe in carbon dioxide and breathe out oxygen. So that's how we have a relationship with plants. Not only do we eat them, not only do the animals that we eat eat plants, again, they're the fundamentals of all life is really plants um, because they are the autotrophs that make food for themselves and everything else on earth. Um, but they also create oxygen for us to breathe. So they breathe in the carbon dioxide that we breathe out and they breathe out oxygen that we breathe in. So it's a really wonderful relationship, which is why plant a tree, plant things in your yard, um, because um, the more things that you plant, the more that we are uh, changing the carbon balance on earth. So um, it isn't just that we're putting off a bunch of carbon dioxide by you know, cows tooting and um, and fossil fuel use and things like that. But we're also cutting down trees and cutting down all these plants that breathe in the carbon dioxide to use it up and create, you know, to create starch in their bodies and, and food for us to eat. Um, so we're doing, we're, we're kind of like 
doing double duty on heating up the earth by knocking down trees and also putting more carbon dioxide in the air. So just keep that in mind. One way that you can reduce your carbon footprint is to actually plant plants because plants will put off more oxygen and absorb more carbon dioxide. They're like a carbon sink. That's what they do. And then when they die, they provide, um, uh, they provide uh, nutrients to the soil because they break down into organic matter. So it's a wonderful thing. Um, also, potassium is responsible for um, root growth. Turger, turger, we were talking about the stomata opening and closing. Turger is how, um, how like uh, crisp a plant is. So sometimes when you, you know, maybe bring home some vegetables and you forget about them in your fridge, like a, a carrot or a, um, a piece of celery and you pick it up and it's limp and kind of movie, it's lost its turger. The water has, has evaporated out of it and you can actually help that by cutting the end and sticking it in water and it will drink in water and perk up again, it will increase its turgor. It will be able to stand, stand up tall and be crispy again. So that's what uh, potassium does for plants. Um, it also prevents lodging. This is something that I just learned. I was like, what the, what's lodging in plants? And it's really a term for grain. So when a grain, when grain is you know, standing upright, it's really easy to go through the field and harvest it. But if it doesn't have enough potassium, it'll at the stem break off and lay over on its side. And what that does is cut the yield in about half because it's very difficult to harvest. So if the plant does not have enough potassium, then it will fall over um, and it's called lodging. So I thought that was really interesting. I learned another thing. So uh, let me show you really quick. Uh, some of the natural sources of potassium are granite clay, which actually we have a lot of potassium in our soils here in North Carolina, because clay can hold on to potassium, whereas like a sandy soil, like on the coast, um, it will actually leach out very quickly, but clay holds on to potassium. But green sand is a really wonderful um, source of it as well. Um, and this is actually, this is mined, um, and it is uh, glauconite and smectite. And where this rock comes from is um, from ancient lakes and seas that were anoxic. Um, where there wasn't a lot of um, um, oxygen. It wasn't completely no oxygen, but that there was low oxygen and there were a lot of marine, a lot of marine life that died, fell to the bottom and fossilized and became a rock. And that's where we get, and it's like a lot of potassium. And you can see it's really, it's rich in potassium because it says zero, zero point one. So there's not a lot of potassium in here per weight, but it's enough because your plants don't need that much of it, but they do need it. So that's a really great way. And this takes a while to break down. So the point one is only available right now, but this breaks down over time to feed your plants over the long term. But read the label so you don't put too much on there um, so you don't kind of OD your plants with this stuff. So, okay. Well, we're about out of time. One thing I do want to tell you is that you almost always know when you have a chemical fertilizer, not always, but you almost know because the color isn't natural. It's usually odorless. It's usually either bright white or like blue or green, um, the numbers match up. These are all ways you can tell usually that you have a chemical fertilizer. Um, organic fertilizers like this fish emulsion, which you can see is very, very rich in, uh, in nitrogen and, and you know not that much phosphorus and potassium. Um, fish emulsion is great when you're starting like little, little seedlings and things, it's wonderful but it smells terrible. So make sure you're doing this outdoors or you're gonna water and walk away from it for like a day because it smells like dead fish. Um, but it's a byproduct of the fish industry. I mean, it's better to use fish guts to make fertilizer than it is to have that stuff go in the landfill. You're actually bottling it and putting it back in the earth. By the way, do not buy this much of it. Oh my gosh, this was, uh, this was a gift from the ag department. Thank you, Dr. Ashley Troth. And um, this will last me even, professionally years. So <laughs> it's a lot. You just buy a little bit. It's real stinky though. And then also like if you open up a bag and it smells like fish and eggs maybe or something, it's, it smells kind of nasty. It's a natural fertilizer because it's a byproduct of all these industries, but it's, it's better for the earth to keep that stuff out of the landfill. And it's now broken down and pelletized and you're going to put it on your plants and it'll become part of the earth again. So so there's so much we could say, but uh, about fertilizer, but I tried to distill it down for you a little bit. So why don't we go ahead and open it up for some questions? Thank you, Sherilyn. Um, okay, so our first question is coming in about the phosphate. 
so you said that the the phosphate that we could buy um not the natural one you you, you suggested we not use I don't mean to gross you out but it's um. <laughs> I don't know it exists, but your body makes it so you said that that is not slow it's pretty slow acting um mm -hmm. if we feel like we have too much nitrogen in our garden what can we do to create kind of a quick a quick turnaround on the phosphate there's a powdered phosphate that works very quickly, um, but have your soil tested because you may have enough in there. If you put too much nitrogen, your plants will eventually use it up. Um, so, you know, if you put way too much nitrogen, you're going to burn your plants. They'll, they'll look like you poured chemicals on them. They'll, they'll you know, just die. Um, but uh, if you wanted to do like um, their shellfish waste, bone meal, like really fine bone meal is a great source of, of um, of phosphorus, um, yeah, wood ash. But again, test your soil because you may already have plenty of that there. And right now it's only like a couple of weeks for a turnaround for a soil test and they're free until Thanksgiving. So just come by our office and pick up a box and, um, and have your soil tested. And then we can actually help you read it afterwards too. Awesome, thank you. Um, so the next question is, what are the benefits to using a chemical fertilizer? Is natural fertilizer better? Well, I mean, again, the big picture is that chemical fertilizer uses a ton of fossil fuel, but at the end of the day, the nutrients are the same. So, you know, the nitrogen is nitrogen is nitrogen. So, you know, you're going to, whether you put this on your plants and you put one of these on your plants, um, your plant is going to treat it basically the same. Some of the, the natural fertilizers actually have um, more than what they say is in there. It's just, it's not immediately available. So it starts to break down over time, especially in the case of like fish emulsion or something like, you know, the plant may only use, there was a recent study out of like, I think it was University of Missouri where like, you know, the nitrogen in here, maybe like 40 or 50% of it is available right away. And then it takes a while and maybe it doesn't become available, all available to all the plants all the time. But fish emulsion, it takes like 15 weeks for it to break down and be uptaken by the plant slowly but surely, but the plant can use like up to 90% of it. So, um, but anyway, they're all not, you know, just like for you, if you get vitamin C from asparagus or vitamin C from an orange, it's still vitamin C. It's kind of like that. Um, but for the bigger picture of things, because we are heating up the earth so fast, um, especially because it isn't just carbon dioxide, because there's a lot of NO2 that is, that is, you know, comes off into the atmosphere and just shoots up the, you know, we're, we're heating up pretty quick. So I try to like as much as possible vote with your dollar. So if that's important to you, then vote with your dollar and, you know, or compost for free. And, uh, and <laughs> I never now with hair, like I used to throw my hair in the garbage and, now, and, and then there was another time where then I went to composting it. So I put it in my compost pile, but now I actually just take it out and like leave it on the back garden because um, birds use it in their nests. So, um, so it all ends up going back to the earth. Awesome. Um, next question is, how do I apply fertilizer? Do I just put it at the top of the soil or do I need to, you know, mix it in? So in the case of like um, uh, phosphate, I believe you can mix it in. Well, you, even some of these organic fertilizers, you can mix in when you're planting something, so long as you're following the directions. So the amount in here, because it's so powerful, covers more ground than the entire amount in here. And you can see like one is significantly heavier than the other. So um, primarily like with this one, because of how powerful it is, the directions are to mix it into, um, mix it into like a liquid format. So you can do that. There's also, you can feed plants first thing in the morning um, by spraying the leaves. So this is called a foliar feeding. Uh, and there'll be directions, if, the, if there'll be directions for it, like this one, you can do spraying, spraying or foliar feeding. And you do it first thing in the morning because the stomata are open. And it's a very efficient way to use fertilizer because this, when you put it on the ground, it takes time for it to break down and for the plant to uptake it. Sort of like taking a pill versus an intravenous injection. That's what spraying on a plant will do because the stomata are open. So the body of the plant can take it up very quickly. But you need to make sure to read the directions, just like taking a pill, a lot of it is lost in the actual digestion of the pill. Whereas 
if you mainline something, if you put something in your veins, it's going to be much, much more powerful and used immediately. So that's very similar um, in the way. So just make sure you read the directions because different fertilizers um, you know, will give different recommendations. And there's been lots of scientists that have gone through all the trouble. And plus you spent money on this, don't waste it. Just follow the directions. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Is there a best all-purpose fertilizer if you can only afford to get one type for your garden? Best all-purpose. I mean, if you can only afford to get one, I would go to like a big box store. And like, I can't promote any brand as a, you know, uh, I like certain ones better than others because I've tried everything for the most part. Um, but as long as it's on the OMRI list, the Organic Materials Review Institute list, I'll use it. So, um, but again, if you don't have a lot of money, have a compost pile, you know, and like you can get a lot of free stuff. There's lots of people with animals that want to get rid of the manure. There's lots of people with, you know, there's lots of coffee shops out there that are just dumping their uh, coffee in the garbage. Um, and this is a shout out to uh, Starbucks, not that I'm promoting their coffee, but I'm promoting their uh, sustainable practices because they keep their coffee in a separate garbage stream. So that if anybody asks for it throughout the shift, they can just give you a bag of just that. So, and not just a little bag, they'll give you a full trash bag. It'll be like 20, 30 pounds. That's a lot of nitrogen. So you can make your own if you don't have money, but you got a little time, just and a compost pile is real easy out here. You don't even need to turn it. You just two parts brown, one part green, stack it up. It'll break down on its own passively over six months. Compost, free. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you very much, Sherilyn. I think we are out of time this week. Um, we may have more questions about this next week because this is a complicated subject. But, yes, um, and feel free to email me, cberry at dconc.gov. Email me. I'd love to answer your questions about it. If I don't know, I'll find out for you. Thank you for coming to our fertilizer talk. We'll see you next week. See you next week, Sherilyn. Thank you. Bye.